aircraft about 40 miles southwest of Tin City? No molds or codes? Do you have any aircraft in that vicinity? Thank you, Delta Bravo. Attention in operation, this is ID. Cat Zulu 235. 40 miles southwest of Tin City, no possibilities. This is Top Rock with an expedite scramble. Authentication time is 1906. Arguably the best air superiority fighter available to anyone anywhere in the world is the F-15. It might well be thought that this aircraft, epitomizing the state of the art, would be the product of a process of decades of constant refinement of a basic specification. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth, because the Eagle is the answer to the blending together of two very real and concurrent problems, both of which caught the Air Force off guard. The air war in Vietnam echoed a message that the Zeros of World War II and the MiG-15s of Korea had already proclaimed, that fighters must be able to fight other fighters. American fighter procurement till that time had provided the Air Force with two sorts of fighter aircraft. Planes that were excellent interceptors, able to cut off and destroy incoming enemy bombers, but not truly capable of taking on enemy fighters in a dogfight. Or planes that were excellent fighter bombers, Aircraft that could fly at great speed and carry a very large and versatile weapons load. But again, could only take on enemy fighters with the aid of heavy and expensive avionics and missilery. The nearest that the United States had to an answer to the MiG was the F-4 Phantom II. But even this superb aircraft was an ill match for the Russian-built planes in a dogfight. It achieved its excellent results through its superior avionics and with the standoff ability supplied by the second crew member with his weapons arrays. In Vietnam, it was the US Air Force's best fighter, with its great speed and the phenomenal lifting power and dependability of two engines. But even this aircraft could not outmaneuver the much lighter and often much older aircraft used by the North Vietnamese. The other alarming problem confronting the Air Force in the mid-60s echoed that presented by the first B-17s in the 1930s, a bomber that could outfly any operationally deployed US fighter. Once again, the plane in question was American. In the mid-50s, the American Strategic Air Command issued a specification for a long-range heavy bomber that could travel comfortably at 2,000 miles per hour. This target was thought to be hypothetical only and not achievable, but nevertheless, it produced one of the most remarkable aircraft of all time, the XB-70 Valkyrie. This brilliant design rose into the air in the early 60s, utilizing almost every scrap of new technology available to the aerospace industry.
Its six enormous turbojet engines were contained in a wedge-shaped hull below the wing. As well as accommodating the power and the undercarriage, the wedged shape was itself a contributor to the aircraft's potency. At the speed of sound, this shape forced the shockwave outwards from the fuselage, a phenomenon that would have been of little value had not the Valkyrie been equipped with movable wingtips, which, lowered, trapped the shockwave, gaining extra lift and speed. This arrangement sprang from a theory called compression lift, which was found not only to be correct, but also to give the Valkyrie a startling edge over anything else in the air. One of the many beneficial side effects of the XB-70 project was the demand that it made on construction materials, with the challenges of tolerance to heat and stress that came with speeds over three times that of sound. In reply to the test, the aerospace industry produced new materials and new ways of forming them, like the honeycomb sandwich, giving lightweight, extreme strength and, where necessary, flexibility. This remarkable film shows the paint on one of the two Valkyrie prototypes flaking, incapable of handling the heat of flight at such high speed. For Russian strategists, the development of this plane must have been an immediate significant threat in that they had no way of confidently shooting it down, reflecting a shortfall in their missile and fighter capability. By this time, Russia had, of course, perfected long-range anti-aircraft missiles, but with the speed and height of the Valkyrie, it was likely that a dangerous percentage of attacking XB-70s would penetrate the Soviets' air defence and reach their targets. The Russian weapons designers went to work on the problem. As it happened, Valkyrie was cancelled, but clearly, Russian fighter designers continued to take its potential into account. In 1968, at the Domodov Air Show in Moscow, the Soviets demonstrated the expected array of military might. But at the end of the show, as a finale, three massive jet aircraft appeared and streaked across the sky. The crowd of foreign observers at the display were stunned by the size and apparent performance of the aircraft. Reports sifting back to the Pentagon on the new plane's proportions and size suggested a plane of awesome top speed. For the next few months, nothing more was seen of the plane, which had been given the NATO code name Foxbat. Then, high in the sky over Israel, an Israeli F-4 located an unidentified blip on its radar and, on climbing higher to investigate it, found it was approaching one of the new Soviet aircraft. In the thin air over 60,000 feet, the Foxbat, seemingly oblivious to the presence of the Israeli plane, was slipping through the air using sophisticated sensors in its nose to record Israeli ground activity. The Phantom, itself a fast, high-flying aircraft, could only slowly approach the new Russian type as both aircraft climbed still higher. The occasion was the first aerial encounter between a Western pilot and one of the new Mark, but the experience was cut short. The Phantom was already straining at top speed to slowly catch the other plane, but the Foxbat was in no way near fully extended. In a matter of seconds, the plane accelerated away, leaving the Phantom floundering. Foxbat clearly had caught the West off guard. Here was a Soviet-built fighter capable of three times the speed of sound already in operation. The US had been contemplating the production of a fighter version of the Valkyrie, 
But this aircraft, the F-108 Rapier, never went beyond the mock-up stage. Had it gone into production, it would have utilised variable geometry on the jet engine intakes to maximise the aircraft's potential at all altitudes. Although the 108 was extensively tested and elaborate models were made, the project was cancelled without a prototype being built. Possibly one reason behind the demise of the Valkyrie and the Rapier was the fact that the US already had a Mach 3 fighter available to it and flying in the form of the YF-12. This superb plane was really a modification of the SR-71 Blackbird, capable of carrying missiles within an internal weapons bay. Only three examples of the YF-12 were produced, the design being used only in a reconnaissance role. By the late 1960s, the United States found itself clearly in the market for a new fighter. For some time previously, the McDonnell Company had been developing designs to fill the high-performance fighter role. Some would have variable geometry of the wings, and some utilise new shapes. But by 1969, they had settled on a basic design which walked away with the Air Force experimental fighter competition, with an order for 20 F-15s going to McDonnell on the 1st of January 1970. By the time the F-15 project was underway, the company had merged with one of its competitors to become the giant McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell was a relative newcomer to the aviation business. Established just three months before the outbreak of World War II, it used more of its wartime capacity to make parts and sub-assemblies for other aircraft companies. Poetically enough, among them was Douglas, which by that time was a well-established aircraft manufacturer, producing planes from the 1920s onwards. However, McDonnell Aviation, although a much smaller company, quickly gained a good reputation for reliability under the leadership of its founder, James McDonnell. Mr. Mack believed heavily in the team spirit, and this clearly gave results when it came to production. The first plane that McDonnell produced of their own was the XP-67, nicknamed the Bat. Only one example of this advanced design was ever produced, and this was to crash during its test period. But this rare film shows the concept was years ahead of its time, utilising a fuselage that blended completely with wing and engine nacelles. Thirty years later, well into the jet age, this concept was to become almost standard. But in 1940, some considered it too revolutionary. The BAT also had provision for placing jet engines behind two props, again clearly reflecting the advanced thinking of the fledgling St. Louis Aircraft Company. Although the BAT did not proceed, the team that had conceived it obviously impressed the military. McDonald's operation grew and they moved the plant to the edge of Lambert Field, which gave them access to a substantial runway. The company was determined to stay at the forefront of the new technology that was emerging in the post-war years. Technology that involved the jet engine that had quickly taken over from piston engines and new designs using much better material than was ever available during the war years. But still, bringing them together with the company's philosophy of a team approach to problems, producing a design team that quickly won the respect of the military and competitors alike. These men are inspecting an F-101 Voodoo, a plane that would be a major success story for McDonnell, but, 
like many of its aircraft, a product of perseverance and commitment to an idea, rather than being built to a strictly confining government specification. As the 50s came and went, McDonnell survived, manufacturing exclusively to fill American military requirements. McDonnell's biggest success came with the development of the F-4 Phantom II. Like many of their other planes, conceived as a Navy fighter, but its versatility soon made it the standard fighter for all three of the American air arms, the only plane ever to do so. Now the St. Louis plant was to produce a new shape. The F-15 design would be subjected to the most critical tests of any aircraft and templates and models were made to confirm the concept's viability. Slowly the prototype began being pieced together like a huge three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Testing and refining still continued as the plane evolved. Here a prototype is seen in the paint shop in the last stages of production. The Air Force officer in charge of the F-15 project gives his thoughts on the team effort. I have never seen a finer joint government industry team that's organized with the technical competence to carry out the job that's been assigned to them or to do it in a manner of close-knit teamwork. Before an invited audience, the first F-15 was rolled out on the 26th of June, 1972. I christen the Eagle and may you reign supreme in your domain. Yeah, yeah. The Eagle's raised canopy gives it the best field of vision of any fighter since the Sabre. Since the first Eagles would only have one pilot, that man would have to have the best vision available. Seen here is the Eagles variable air intakes, a truly sophisticated feature which allows its computer to optimize the air supply for any angle of attack. This massive air brake running down the aircraft's spine not only slows the plane, but makes it more manoeuvrable in certain circumstances. Being conceived from the outset as an air superiority fighter, provisions were made for built-in cannon, something the early Phantoms had been designed without. But for normal attack, the medium-range Sparrow missile, a development of those used over Vietnam, was to be carried two abreast each side of the plane's engine. The four Sparrows would be supplemented by four more Sidewinder missiles, shown here on the outside, used for short-range attack when the cannon was not suitable. 
Fully armed, the F-15 Eagle was a truly potent aircraft, which it was hoped could counter anything the Soviets could produce. Its distinctive twin fins sit each side of the complex jet exhaust and give the aircraft increased stability at high speed and allow the pilot maximum control of the aircraft if it were to lose an engine in flight. All in all, McDonnell and the Air Force thought the Eagle would be the answer to fighter needs for years to come. But this was yet to be proven and for the aircraft's first flight it was shipped to Edwards Air Force Base. Here, the complex jet exhausts, sometimes known as turkey feathers, adjust as the engine starts for a ground test prior to its first flight. In case of brake failure, the plane is securely moored to the runway for the static engine test series. When the technicians are satisfied, the pilot, Irv Burrows, makes his inspection. You can get some indication of the aircraft's immense size as he walks up under the wing. With so much at stake, he's understandably cautious. The engines are slowly started again and the ground crew disperse as, for the first time, the Eagle taxis under its own power. Even on the ground, the McDonnell F-15 Eagle is an impressive sight. The red markings on the wing intake tips and tails are only used on the prototype and not on the production models. Here, the massive Pratt & Whitney F100 turbofan engines, part of the secret of the Eagle's phenomenal performance, are brought up to take off thrust. With the brakes released, Irv Burrows lifts the Eagle on its first flight. Screaming down the runway, he pulls the stick back and Eagle number one is in the air. Though short, the Eagle's first flight was a total success. With the air brake raised, the plane slows for its approach. Here, as it begins its landing with an F-4 chase plane following, it almost looks small. Shown again in slow motion, you can appreciate the aircraft's great size. 
You can also see how the air intakes are adjusted to the horizontal, even though the aircraft is tilted back. With his first flight behind him, Irv Burroughs must be a man who is full of sensations. But, quite clearly, his first impression is nothing but positive. During the months that followed, the process of testing continued relentlessly, as the prototype F-15s were put through every possible role it might be expected to perform. And by late 1974, it was ready to be commissioned by the Air Force about to become its number one fighter. On the 14th of November 1974, President Ford was on hand for the acceptance of the Air Force's first operational F-15. Soon the F-15, slowly but steadily, was going into service. One of the first challenges of the F-15 was to demonstrate its manoeuvrability against other fighters because it was agility that the previous generation of American aircraft had lacked over Vietnam. Perhaps the most agile of all American fighter aircraft after the Eagle was the Northrop F-5, a light, twin-engined and extremely clever little aircraft. In many ways, it had some of the characteristics of the MiGs over Vietnam and had been able to outfly all American fighters prior to the Eagle. In this remarkable film, the Eagle, almost twice the size of the F-5, is able to keep the smaller plane in its sight at all time. A truly impressive demonstration of the F-15's capability. About the same time the Air Force received its first Eagles, another F-15 was being prepared to attempt high altitude records, which had previously been split between McDonald's Phantom and the Russian Foxbat. At a pre-test briefing, the three pilots selected for the record attempts meet with company and Air Force representatives. Major Roger Smith was the pilot who flew the first and last flights in the series. The other two pilots involved in the program were Major McFarlane and Major Dave Peterson. These pilots were trained for a very particular task, to go to the plane's absolute ceiling in the shortest possible time. Here one of the team is going through the difficult procedure of being installed in the F-15. 
with all of his special support equipment for the elaborate protection which is necessary when you contemplate flying almost 100,000 feet, looking more like an astronaut than an airman. On a cold winter morning in January, the specially prepared F-15, which to save weight is not even painted except for the Streak Eagle badge, is rolled out onto the snow-covered runway. Symbolically enough, the chase plane which will follow the Eagle for its first stage of flight is a reconnaissance version of the Phantom, which previously held the American record. The Streak Eagle test series purpose was to break a multiplicity of speed to ceiling records. For several days, the three pilots constantly flew the Streak Eagle, gradually increasing the height and speed, and all three were to individually achieve specific records, with Roger Smith obtaining the final record for absolute height and speed.
Steadily, the F-15 Eagle took up its roles with the Tactical Air Command and Air Defence Command. Not only the pilots, but also the ground crew had to become familiar with an aircraft as advanced as tomorrow. Eagles were soon deployed to Europe, where they stand in the West's front line, the sensitive area where East confronts West on a daily basis, and brinkmanship is a practised skill, where the presence of a trained pilot and fine aircraft could do more to preserve peace in troubled times than many would acknowledge. From various European bases, F-15 pilots would constantly train and exercise to ensure the peak of performance. Always on hand, they may seem leisurely now, but the tempo can speed as the need demands. Here, several F-15s go on a standard NATO exercise, pitting their aircraft's capabilities against other Allied planes. Each F-15 group is a self-contained unit. Ground staff for the F-15 are highly skilled technicians. And in today's Air Force, where the requirement is often more for skill than it is for strength, women work alongside men.
poetically, the F-15, which was originally designed as a specific air superiority fighter and not for any other role, now finds itself in an E-model similar to its Phantom forebear. The irony of this is that the Air Force wanted and got a dedicated fighter that could beat all oncomers. Now the brilliance of the original concept has been extended so that a two-seat version, the Strike Eagle, will be able to act as a tactical bomber, carrying enormous payload, but still be able to proceed onto the fighter mission as required. Little more could be asked of any fighter aircraft than that now available from the F-15. With its high flying capacity, the Eagle is also used as a vehicle to carry the LTV ASAT anti-satellite missile, which is designed and quite capable of achieving what its description suggests. Spy satellites were a concern for some time to the Americans, and an economical way of disposing of them was demonstrated in September 1985, when a US satellite, nearing the end of its useful life, was sent plummeting down by an ASAT missile launched from an Eagle at the height of 80,000 feet. The basic design of the F-15 lends itself to considerable further development and one approach which is being evaluated is a short takeoff and landing variant. This computer model shows how one derivative of the F-15 employs swept canards forward of the wing giving higher maneuverability and adjustable jet exhausts which will alter direction of their thrust to the aircraft's requirement in any given situation. But clearly its ancestry is the basic eagle still well defined. Three other nations also utilize the Eagle. Japan has approximately 100 in service and it represents that nation's first line of aerial defense replacing earlier F-4s. Israel also flies F-15 Eagles and is one of only two nations to have used it in anger. Israel's F-15s have on several occasions dispatched Syrian MiGs with an almost routine efficiency. The third non-American user of the F-15 is Saudi Arabia. This nation's eagles have also tasted blood in the sensitive area around the Persian Gulf. Iran, still flying F-4s purchased prior to the revolution, uses this aircraft to patrol the region and in June 1984 a small group was sent to strike oil platforms in the Gulf. Patrolling Saudi F-15s were quickly advised of the Iranian aircraft by US AWAC radar aircraft high in the sky over the Gulf. Forewarned, the Saudi pilots quickly located and identified the F-4s, two of which never made it home. US F-15s, like all other operational fighters, are constantly kept in a state of readiness with regular tests and competitions. The William Tell weapons meet between Canadian and American fighters is a competition that offers the most prestigious awards for the participants. It is a test not only of aircraft and pilots, but also of ground crews. 
every aspect of aircraft efficiency is examined and points are scored relative to the overall performance and not just one moment of success. Increasingly, the F-15 Eagles are competing as the model takes over from earlier aircraft which stood to defend the North American continent. F-4 Phantoms and Convair F-106s, in conjunction with Canadian 101 Voodoos, will nevertheless give the Eagles opposition enough, because the prize was not just for the plane, but rather for the combination of man and machine, and the teamwork that keeps them in the air. Here, a supersonic drone is launched to act as a target. Instantly, the F-15 pilot identifies the drone on the heads-up display, and quickly a short-range Sidewinder missile is sent to seek out its prey. With the job done, the Eagle returns, so that the kill and just about every other aspect of combat effect and air and ground efficiency can be judged. 
The standard of the competition is such that winning is an achievement to remember. In the frozen wastelands of Alaska, different technology represents the very front line of US air defense. Radar stations placed in the most inhospitable of environments constantly scan the skies over the Bering Straits for the approach of Russian aircraft. Even in times of peace, the two nations test each other in a routine that hopefully will not go beyond that of saber rattling. As the giant dish rotates, information on any Russian prowlers is collected and fed to patrolling F-15s. High in the cold sky, two Eagle drivers are sent to intercept, guided by constant updates from the ground control monitoring the Russian long-range bomber as it probes US airspace. The Russians' massive turboprop aircraft, with their tremendous range, constantly keep US air defences on their toes, and there is no better weapon to respond to their presence than the F-15 Eagle. <laughs> 